thank you above all to the four C's and to Shirley Rose and others on the selection committee for making this moment possible. And thanks to my longtime heroes, Chuck Bazerman, Jackie Royster, Ann Gear, and Mike Rose for their support and fellow feeling. My father worked as a small town newspaper reporter from the time that he dropped out of high school in the 1930s until he retired. The ends of his fingers were square, and I imagined that that was because of all the pounding that he did on a typewriter. Writing manifested to me when I was a child as a form of manual labor. When I was 16, I asked the owner of the newspaper if I could work there too, after school and in the summers. So I joined my father in the newsroom, which was one big word factory. Eight reporters at their desks, no cubicles, talking on the phones, clacking on the typewriters, carrying stories over to the editor who would mark them up with his thick blue pencil and send them in a pneumatic tube to the typesetters upstairs. When we all walked out of work a few hours later, we would take a copy of that day's paper from a pile at the front desk, the ink still a little wet and fragrant, and we'd, we would read it that evening along with our neighbors. I struggled in my work at the newspaper because I was and still am terrible on the telephone. Uh, but the most painful part involved those times when something I wrote had unintended harmful consequences. Fortunately, eventually, I was able to find a different line of work. But I gained from that experience a model of writing that superseded the one I experienced in academic life. I learned early that writing was a way to earn a living, that it was material, that it made noise, that it had a production history, that it circulated, that it had consequences for others and especially for the writer. And writing remained, in my view, a manual and not just a cerebral experience. My father never learned the proper way to type, but in the way he moved his fingers over the keys when he wrote, you could tell that his hands were full of language, genre, purpose, and integrity. My father was my most formative exemplar. When I got to graduate school at Indiana University in the late 1970s, I took a Victorian literature course with Don Gray, who was also at the time the editor of College English. Don taught me that it was okay to be a scholar who asked obvious questions. In his class, he would raise the most basic, most earnest, most straightforward, most modest questions but by the end of the discussion, we inevitably reached profound and connected realizations. I learned from Don that if you start an inquiry too far away from the basic questions, the results are going to be shallow. In my second year at Indiana, Marilyn Sternglass joined the faculty as its first trained composition researcher, and that is when my professional lucky streak began. Marilyn plowed open a curricular path, an interdisciplinary path, for the study of writing. She taught us how teaching and research could inform each other, how they needed to inform each other, and that if literacy teaching was merely rewarding privilege instead of expanding human capacities, it was worse than worthless. As in so many English departments, composition was badly misunderstood and stigmatized when Marilyn was there. And several times she had to stand up alone to speak on behalf of the program and the students in it. I know it must have been difficult, but she formed a spine of steel on our behalf. For Marilyn, I tried to pay it forward. In 1983, I was given a career at the University of Wisconsin-Madison, where I worked with colleagues and graduate students in the writing program who lifted me up on the strength of their ideas, innovation, 
their work ethic and commitment to excellence. Most of the time, all I was doing was running to try to keep up with my colleagues or to stay a step ahead of the students or to make them think I was ahead of them anyway. The students' thoughts were so big. Their projects, ambitious and socially important. Their teaching, courageous and enviable. Their passion, infectious. I would breathe in all of this and try to say back to them what I thought might be timely, valuable, and original in what they were doing. They took that away with them, but would never realize how much more they were leaving behind in me. They grew me with their spirit. Those former students, now professors, led by Tim Laquintano, initiated the nomination process for this award. And I want them to know how much I love them and how rewarding it is to think about the good work they are doing for the field and for students and for the society. Like my late father, I was never trying to be an exemplar. I was just trying to do my job. Thank you again.